Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Bork. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Um, today is May 15th, 2024. And today we're going to be talking about uh, sustainability with Creo uh, GTO. And uh, if you're not familiar with these webinars, we do them every Wednesday. This is my second one. Uh, and I'm enjoying um, working on these and showing off uh, interesting capabilities within the software. A little bit about myself. Um, I have over 35 years of engineering experience. I started as a machinist and grew through the ranks to becoming a programmer. I actually worked at MIT Lincoln Laboratory and helped move through digital transformation from the drawing board to CAD. I actually got um, Pro Engineer and got it installed, taught people how to use it, and uh, loved the software so much that I actually went and worked for PTC. Uh, and I was one of the founders of the Pro Engineer Wildfire interface. So I worked for, for PTC. If you're familiar with the Wildfire and, and Creo itself, I have a lot of work that I've done in that area. And then I also moved into PTC University and got involved in things like uh, some of the education, which is what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in education. I didn't go to college. I don't have a degree in FEA, which is what some of this technology is going to be using. That's why I've included my my partner and colleague, Terry Robbins, who's with me here as well. Uh, you can see he has a lot of experience in CFD, CAE, uh, as well as he has a good fundamental experience of finite element analysis, which is really how this technology works. I hope you can all hear me. Maybe someone can give me a thumbs up, but say that they, they can hear me. All right, <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna tell you a little story here. I've got this bracket that I need to make in my basement, and I went to the drawing, uh, and I just kind of sketched this up. And just like anybody else, I went to Creo, and I modeled it like this. And uh, I thought, what am I doing? I could actually maybe ask the computer to, to actually solve the problem for me, because I went into creating that bracket without really understanding the loads, how much weight it'd be carrying. I really over-designed it. So what I'm going to be showing you today, and if I just play this animation here, you'll see that I'm going to be using uh, Creo uh, Generative Topology Optimization to actually try to whittle away the material. And it does this by understanding its conditions. It knows the part uh, is uh, made of a certain material. Uh, it knows that my uh, requirement is to remove certain percentage of material. Uh, in this particular case, I'm running, I think, a modal analysis. And in some cases, it takes away, I think, too much geometry. So with one setting, I'm able to kind of rechange and reconfigure and then rerun uh, another part. So look at this part here. I'm just going to take and change some of these values and run this again. And you can see that Creo is designing the problem for me. It's designing the uh, geometry. It's making up that geometry. And uh, you'll see in a little bit, I'm going to be able to convert that geometry into usable geometry. And I've actually, at the end, you'll see, have already 3D printed this part, uh, my printer, and have printed it uh, successfully. So let's just let this animation finish. And I've sped up these videos a little bit for, uh, for our sake here, because sometimes this can take a few minutes to, um, to repaint its screen here. I think after this animation, I'm going to convert this part to um, B rep geometry. So what you're seeing in blue is somewhat of a preview of what the geometry would look like. And if I'm satisfied with that, I'm going to be able, okay, there it turns green. I'm going to be able to reconstruct this into a form of geometry that I can actually machine or 3D print. And later on in the presentation, uh, you'll see me give examples of how I'm able to uh, teach um, and get the design to do various tricks, such as I want to machine this part. And notice this is B-Rep geometry. I can still add rounds to this. And that's the kind of stuff that I'll be showing you today in today's uh, presentation. Pretty exciting stuff. So what is generative design and topology optimization? You know, actually, it kind of brings back a lot of memories. GTO was a car that my friend had. I had a Mopar in school. He had a GTO. It's actually a great uh, name for a product. Uh, but, you know, when I think about GTO, I now think of parts like this. This was designed by a computer. So um, what it is not is not a tool 
to use at the end of your design. I wouldn't take this bottom design and try to um, you know, start with that. I wouldn't take a finished part. So it's something that you use early and there are just some design skills that are required. As I understood, as I mentioned, there are some FAA understanding. It's something that you want to do at the beginning of the design process when you're designing a problem. And I hope to show you some of that in some of the demonstrations. I'm going to give you a demo of a bracket. I'm going to demonstrate the problem that I'm trying to create. I'll show you that I'm going to create some starting geometry, which I call a playground. I can create areas that I want to keep. And I'll show you also how to work with bodies. Uh, we'll create a part that's optimized for machining. And then I get another a demo of a bracket and a wrench, and we'll use multi-body to create the problems, the base, the slider, the nut. I've got a bunch of, of demonstrations to show you. And um, remember that uh, there's a lot of constraints and loads that you need to understand. So I hope to show you how I've set up some of those constraints and loads, because that's how you come up with the geometry that this creates. And there's also things like contact. So in some cases, I've actually contacted the part the base with the top using the contact. And then there's this design criteria, which you can set up multiples for. And then I'm going to make the problem even harder by adding a pipe to go through. And I'll change the part, make uh, changes to the height of the part to see what happens. So you're seeing I'm going to go through a lot of iterations. I'm going to let Creo come up with the geometry every time. I'm going to rerun the optimization over again. I'm going to create more B-Rep geometry and take a look at that. Uh, 3D print some of that. And then I'll also show you that how generative design can be used for concepts. Not only do I have to use this geometry, I don't have to use it, I can use it as an idea and create more primitive looking features, uh, which I hope to show you a little bit too. Um, I've got a grid of parts in the next couple of slides that show you various design configurations that I was able to make. And again, all, it, all I did was I started with the shaft, uh, I started with the base, and I started with putting a load and constraints on how the part moves, and I'll show you some of those examples. I thought it would be good to start out by showing you the slides that PTC has on uh, GTO. You can see here on the right-hand side how um, someone has constructed the most important aspects of the part. Uh, which are the areas where the bolts are. Those are shown in blue. As the part progresses, uh, and the, the gray areas or the brown areas are the areas we want to keep away from. There's uh, areas there that are uh, space claims that are, we want to stay away from. So in this case, um, they were able to save uh, 1.6 um, pounds, uh, not save it, but get the part down to 1.6 pounds, which was uh, uh, much better than someone could do. Um, and this is using um, a kernel called Frustum uh, as its FAA solver, and that's uh, in the background. There's also another extension you can get called the Generative Design Extension, and this is really when you have honed in on a particular problem that you want to solve, but you want to run maybe thousands of iterations to look for the best results. Uh, this is cloud-based, and you can use this to send a series of design um, uh, constraints and, and simulation ideas to the system and get back um, somewhat of a idea. And you can choose which one you want to download and you can go work on it from there. I'm also going to be showing Creo 11. So Creo 11 just launched. And this, um, the point I want to make to you here is that this product keeps getting better. This is not a stale product. This is a new technology. This is a new area for PTC, and they continue to evolve the technology. And one of the capabilities they've added here, which I've been using, is this bearing load support. Another capability that's been added in Creo um, 11, which I really like, is this minimum feature size. Uh, if you could see my cursor, the first design has all these sort of holes in there, and I might not want those holes for various reasons. I want a more of a uniform looking part. Well, here I can give it a minimum crease, a minimum feature size of 35 millimeters, and I can also say that the part is symmetric across a front datum plane, and I get a part that looks more uniform, and I'm using a feature size of 35 millimeters. It's a very great capability that I'll show you also. And then there's also support for symmetry. Um, when you reconstruct the geometry, you'll see that it's going to use style and freestyle. 
to do its work and it will really honor the type of pat if you say that the part should be symmetric it'll make sure that it is truly symmetric even though the preview may not look symmetric it will be symmetric when it's reconstructed from the b-rep to the b-rep geometry of as i said all right, so I want to show you, I have sort of a picture show to take you, take you through, and then we're going to actually look at the software and actually try to do our own study. So here is a, a part that I've got. Um, you can see that I've modeled a shaft, I've created a, uh, a base, and I just said I wanted to limit the volume by 35%. This is made out of aluminum. Um, by changing that limit volume, I was able to get different looking results. Here's another version, another version. And so you can get, uh, and then I changed the height of the part. Uh, I added a keep away spot, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but this part is a little bit taller. Um, and these are all just, again, uh, iterations from the same design using design constraints, okay? And this is using just um, the limit volume, 35%. And then I was able to even get it down to something like that as well. It has some other features that I added on top of it. So. You, I'll show this when we do the when we go into the demonstration this design criteria. But let's say that your plan was to get through this. Your plan was to 3D print the part. Well, you can add a design constraint and set the build direction, and you can su su set the kind of support angles that your printer can support, and it starts creating your geometry that's able to be printed. And I've actually 3D printed some of these parts. And one of them is uh, one of the ones that I ended up using. So again, you can have these design constraints still remove the percentage of material, but get the software to sort of, um, you know, go for a particular design criteria, such as a 3D printer. And you can also use it to do CNC work. Um, here is another design constraint. Uh, this is called linear extrude. And what I've done here is I've given it a, uh, a plane and I plan to machine it, and it created me geometry that looks like this. It's created me geometry that looks like this. And then again, I stretched the part and kind of looked at it a little differently and added a wrench to the side of it, but that was just, again, very just quick, simple turn on setting. And then I even set the extrude angle um, on, a, on the side, a sort of bisecting the part. It came up with this very interesting shape. And again, these are all, these are all designs that the system have come up with. So let's look at a demonstration. Uh, let's get into the software and let's look at um, what we're doing here. So I've got Creo here and I've got, um, let me show you, I've got some areas, I've got some bodies uh, defined. So I'm gonna make, so I've got a shaft and that shaft is right here. You can see as a body, it's just an extrude. And if you don't know about bodies yet, bodies are a really important aspect of learning how to use this tool. You need to know how to create bodies that overlap. Uh, you can, I'm going to take you through how I created these. So the very first thing I did was I created a shaft, and I, I called that sh I called it a shaft, and it's um, and then I created sort of a playground of space, uh, which I will just highlight here and I show you this. This is the entire space that I want to give uh, the system to play with. Let me turn the shaft back on so you can see that. And then I've got um, this preserved geometry, which is something I don't want to lose, which is this, um, I'm going to actually take the, sh I'm going to take the playground. And if you didn't know, you could right click and make it transparent so you can see through it. Okay, so this is a little bit easier to look at. Let me take a sip of water. So I have de defined, I think, enough of the problem where I can now switch over to generative design, and I do so by clicking applications and going into generative design. Now, in this case, it's already run a design. Um, I want you to notice over here in the model tree, this is where I'm gonna be pointing out. This particular structure is active. Notice it's got a little light there. That means it's active. I could make another one active as well by clicking this one. So that means that you can run various different types of um, of iterations. This particular one I'm running has a constraint where the bottom is fixed and there is a load uh, which is a moment and a moment is a load that moves and I'm going to show you that if I if I just run this display simulation and show off the uh, displacement 
and show the animation, we should be able to see what I'm talking about, how it moves. Is this is what I'm trying to prevent, and this is exact. This is exaggerated quite a bit, but this is what I'm trying to pre trying to prevent. All right, so let me turn on that off. So right now it's um, I'm removing. Let's see, 35%. Let's change that number to 50%. And this is what I recommend people doing. Just go with the basics. Okay, so I'm, I've got 50%. Notice that the uh, geometry goes away. And um, it says that the study is fully defined, meaning I've got set up my, I've got something fixed. I've got something um, that's uh, a moment. I've got a force. Uh, I even have a contact. Um, so all I need to do now is click the optimize button. And it should start to reconstruct some geometry. And it won't take as much away. And it will look something like this. Now that part's pretty uh, pretty big. Uh, I could continue to say that I want this part to be a lower number. Let's put in 40% and let's see what it does. And just run the optimization again. And now I'm, I should get a different looking part. And you can spin the model while this is happening. I want you to notice up here, it's counting. And if I like this geometry, I could um, convert it to solid geometry. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, make it a little bit lighter. I would like to bring this down to 35%. And once again, optimize. And I'm getting a part that looks like that. Now, I've got a new problem here because I really haven't fully thought through the issue, and that's fine. That's why I call this a design tool. It's something you use. Um, but if I wanted to print this, if I wanted to use this geometry, I would now click Generate Design. I'm going to move this to the center so you can see. And my recommendation is to click Reconstructed and click 1 and click Generate. And right now, the system is using freestyle and restyle to reconstruct the geometry as actual B representation geometry, which I can further modify. That's a very important thing. I haven't left the tool. I'm still in Creo. I'm going to show you in a minute where I'm going to add an area for a wrench so that I can get around um, this problem of actually being able to attach this thing. I am actually fully thought that through. So let's just wait for it to come up with its design, so just so I can show you that it does create very nice looking geometry. Look at that. If I just turn on um, shading with reflections, these are very nice surfaces. And again, I can still add rounds to this kind of stuff. If I want to add more rounds, I can add rounds to these features here and uh, sort of, um, you know, get more closer to the part that I want. But I could also use this as a guide. Um, as I look at this part, I'm thinking, hmm, uh, I don't want this anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click this and go delete. And we're going to go back to the beginning, back into the application, generate to design, because I want to show you what would happen if I asked for a linear extrude. Let's say that I want to pick this plane as it's extrude. And let's see what it comes up with now. It should start to give you geometry that's machinable, a little bit easier to make. Sometimes it starts to take away too much material, but it, it'll come back. But isn't that quite interesting that all I've told it to do is that I plan to machine this part. And I can set angles and so forth. Uh, and I've chosen linear extrude going in both directions, bi-directional. I'll show you that's an option that we can change. But let's just let this go ahead and run. It should create the geometry we're looking for. I'm going to switch to uh, another uh, sort of more complicated uh, scenario. Um, let me show you this particular study here. This is where I have actually modeled um, the wrench envelope. Uh, so I know that I need to get this wrench in there, and I want Creo to come up with some kind of geometry uh, that works. 
So what I'm using here is I've said it was going to be aluminum. I'm going to switch it to use nylon. So I'm going to redefine this design criteria. I'm going to flip on nylon because I can, I know that I can 3D print this. I'm going to change this to 45%. Let's see the type of geometry that it creates. And so what this is doing, it's avoiding the areas that I, uh, I don't want the tool to touch. So over here, you see in the model tree, I've excluded the nut and the wrench envelope. Um, and so that's not being considered as part of its reduction of the amount of mass. So here it's creating a part and let's just let it finish. This is 10%. So um, while we're waiting for this, I'm going to stop sharing and start a poll. Uh, it's my first time trying a poll. I hope this works. I would like to ask this question uh, to those that are on today's uh, meeting. I hope that shows up for you. Have you used generative design before? Someone has said no. Five people have said no. Seven people have said no. One person says yes. Okay, that's cool. Oh, it's really exciting to know that you're all here. I, I really love using Creo. I use Creo six hours a day, and I love learning this, this new technology. It's a really new way to think about designing parts. Okay. So we got one person who's used it before, and most of you haven't, so I'll end the poll. I'll share those results so you can see um, what that looks like. Okay. That's pretty cool. Let me share my screen again. And let's see what Creo is doing now. All right, so it's created me a part. It's actually still working its way through there. It's 53%. Sometimes it can be a point where you want to go away and get some coffee, uh, but it, it isn't so bad. I love the fact that you can kind of spin this around and see what it's doing as it's working. Um, but this is actually a very interesting way to solve a problem. Um, instead of me going to the computer and designing a bracket that I have no idea whether it's going to be strong enough, I'm using the computer in a new way to solve its problem. And it comes up with some very interesting funky geometry, uh, but this is all based on an FEA simulation. So in theory, if you know about the constraints, if you know how the part is going to live and function and how it needs to form and perform, what material it's going to be made out of, you can use this tool. Look at that part, that's pretty interesting. Still working. So um, while I'm waiting for that to finish, I'll start another poll. Let me stop sharing. Tools, polls. I would really like to know this question. I will admit to you that I come with very little experience in this area. Are you experienced in FEA? Finite element analysis. Because this is actually an interesting way to learn about that um, and that's why I've included Terry in today's discussion if you have questions about the types of loads and constraints that I put in the part and why I put it there. I have actually have a part that I'll show you in a little bit that, um, that changes behavior as I move the stresses, uh, adding extra digits and saying this part is moving in this direction, this side is moving in that direction. All right, so I will end and share the results. Uh, three uh, say no. Uh, four, do you say yes, you're experienced in FEA simulation, and eight is somewhat. And I'm, I'm in that somewhat category myself. So let me close that poll. And sometimes this happens. Um, it did not uh, resolve. I think I'm asking too much from it. Uh, if this happens to you, what I often do is I will go in here and change some of these constraints uh, and ask for a different number. So I think 50 is the number, and I'm actually going to ask for it to be use a minimum feature size of and what's interesting here is I really love they did this I can type in 15 millimeters this is a metric part I could choose inches and if my plan is to machine this part I could type in a quarter inch all in mill I would type in half inch so let's see what that does let's see what those changes do let's optimize this again 
and see how Creo evolves on this problem. So in this particular case, I'm running a modal study, which means it's going to shake the part and vibrate it. I've I've told it that the um, this part here is allowed to move cylindrically back and forth, which I'll show you in a minute once it's done with its design. Um, so this is not an FEA simulation. This is more of a modal study where it's vibration and it's trying to target a certain number that I've typed in. So it's going to be an interesting way of removing material that's unnecessary. Uh, but this is not a real great use case because I actually really do want to hold a pipe and I really do want to make sure that it can hold thousands of pounds. Um, but I want to show you, and I'll show you a little bit later on, you could use modal studies for cases when you don't know the loads uh, and you just want to remove material. So uh, that's what this is doing here. It's getting close to finishing. Maybe while that's working, I will open up another poll, launch poll. Question is, do you have parts that you want to make lighter and more efficient? It was really strange to add the word no. I hope no one says no. <laughs> we should all want to do that. I think we're asked always by our design um, uh, sort of a challenge to make parts that are really efficient. And, you know, we live in a world of 3D printing. We live in a world of advanced manufacturing. You can pretty much make almost anything today. And so let me share the results of that poll. Not one person said no, so you're all interested in the same thing, and that is really cool, and I appreciate that very much. Let me share my screen again. Let's see where Creo came. And this is a great way to learn the tool. Okay, it's got this geometry that's created. It's blue. It's still meaning it's calculating. While I'm doing that, I want to show you this other type of analysis that I ran. Um, this one is created me geometry that looks like this, but let me go back in and sort of close and show you that I started with the problem by creating these, um, these very simple, I created a block and I called that rigid because that plans to be bolted to the side of something. I've created another extrude and I called that, uh, a rigid pin. Um, that is uh, not shown, but I will hide it and so we don't need to see it right now, but that's what it looks like. Um, I really wish there was a way to show all these. Okay, there we are. Uh, oh, that's kind of interesting how you can see what it used to look like before because it's showing you this generative hybrid from itself a while ago that I did. But all right, I've created this, this condition and I've created this pin and then I've created this slider that needs to slide on the pin. I've also created a pin over here. I've extruded that as well. Now that I look at that, I want to make that maybe four thick. And did you just notice what just happened? That the build volume got bigger. I'm using a new feature in Creo called uh, build volume, uh, enclosure volume. And it, it, I'm using it to make, make sure that the, the, the space that I give, the playground that I give, is always parametric. And there's lots of different ways that I could do this, but i just making that five millimeters, okay? And then um, I have created this um, enclosure volume, as I mentioned. Uh, when you use enclosure volume, it's going to look at your part and try to figure out what's the best way to enclose that. There's actually an optimize button, which I can click, and there's no other way to optimize that. So I'm just going to go with the aligned option. But what it does is it gives you a quilt. But what you can do is you can turn that quilt into a body by using a solidify feature. So rather than me um, taking the time to create uh, the space that I wanted to, the, the playground is what I'm calling this space. That's what I call that. This is the area we're going to let Creo uh, GTO work with. Then what I do is I subtract um, from the body um, the pins. I don't want to have the pins show up. And I subtract that here too. And I end up with a body that looks like this. And I'll just show you what my playground looks like. This is what the playground looks like. This is what I'm going to give to Creo to solve the problem. Um, and then I've got this area here, which I'm going to use to show you this is going to be a keep away zone. I don't want to make, I want to make sure material, maybe there's something in the way I want to make sure that material stays away from this area. Okay, so let me turn on all my bodies again. 
and let's uh, hide the generative design body that it thought it did before. And mind you, I can keep making changes and modifications as I design, but I'm going to switch over to generative design. And uh, let's revisit the, the structure that I have created. Um, I've got this item is fixed to the bottom. Okay, so that's the way I've decided to fix it. I could have used in the side, but I've chosen the bottom here. And I've got a cylindrical constraint here that I'm letting, letting, letting run free. I can choose fixed, uh, and I'll get different results, but I'm going to let it run free. Uh, there's a reason for that. And then I'm going to put a force. And notice that I put the force in an interesting direction. I wanted to see if I could get um, I actually believe that the forces were going to move this direction. So when you're setting up forces, it's going to have you pick a coordinate system, which you can see I already selected one. And it needs you to select which direction is this force going. In this case, I said it's going in the minus Y, and it's going in, the, in, in, in Z in one direction. In number one, I could type in 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and I give it a magnitude of, uh, of 10,000 pounds. When I'm done, it shows me a nice preview of where that is going to happen. That's what that looks like. I'm also adding a moment. A moment A moment is a type of load that moves. And what I've done is, again, I have the coordinate system, and I've given it a moment of minus 5 on x, minus 5 on y, and I did nothing with the 0. I'm giving it a magnitude of 40,000. Click OK. And I've also applied a force here as well. Let's go look at that. I really wish the preview worked uh, while you were setting this up. But if I just uh, highlight my coordinate system, you can see that I'm going in uh, a half, half, one, and it's 1,000 pounds, or actually 10,000 pounds, pounds of force. So I'm going to first. Uh, notice that I've already set up the playground. Starting geometry is the playground. I've said that I want to preserve that uh, slider. I want to preserve that slider. And I want to keep this rigid body. And so these are my things I want to preserve. I don't want GTO to remove these. I've also said to avoid this red area. Um, just for the heck of it, I'm going to remove it. And I'm going to hide it so we don't see what its effect is. And we'll see the type of different um, experience we get. So let's see. I have a void. I'll just click hide. And now let's see and click the optimize button. It says it's ready to be defined, ready to be, de to be defined. I'm going to click optimize. And let's see what it comes up with. This one's working quite fast. So we should be able to see and show the animation. It's a pretty interesting look. It has created that geometry like so, and I could continue to refine that. But what I want to do is show the simulation results. I'll just drag this over here, this really cool viewer here that lets you see displacement. And what I could do is I can animate that displacement, and I can see the way this part is supposed to prevent from happening. This is what it's how it's constructed. Of course, this is. A, very largely exaggerated. Uh, if I hit uh, reset here and set the scale down to a much more regular level, I get to see a much smaller animation of what might happen. Okay, but that's the, the geometry that is created. And uh, this is sort of automatic because as I make my part bigger, um, in fact, let's just go do that. Let's close this tool. And um, I'll go back to the sketch that I used to create a lot of this in the first place. Let me change the dimension. Let's move this over here. Let's move this over here. Right? We just go back to Applications, Generative Design. Now we have a, a, a new problem, but notice the build volume got automatically uh, resized. Let's optimize this. And I probably would. Um, in this case, use a starting geometry that was a little bit more um, closer to 
like I might draw tangent lines across them, but look at this part here. It's interesting what it's doing. Okay, that's quite interesting. I might want this part to be, let's say I like this. I can, let's say I'm gonna 3D print this. Hmm, what I could do now is I could say, actually, let me, before I do that, I'm gonna actually go here and say, generate design, reconstructed. Let's see if this works. And I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to do another poll. Do any of you use 3D printing? Someone answered ready. Oh, yeah, interesting. Three people are saying six. Yes, getting more people, votes. That's really cool. 11 people using 3D printing, two people not. Maybe I should have added a question. No, but I'm interested. Um, you can do metal printing now. You can do 3D printing of plastics. You could do uh, all kinds of interesting stuff with 3D printing. And that's where I really like about this tool is it can create you geometry that is 3D printable. So I'll share those results. And so that's what we get. We get most of you have 3D printers. That's really cool. You either have them at home maybe. Uh, you might have them at the office. Um, so that's really cool. Let me go back and share my screen and get back to the presentation. Okay, let me get back to my PowerPoint and show you some other stuff. Um, this is a video showing you um, what the part looks like and how you can visualize and see uh, the various um, colors and displacement. I think later on I show you how the part gets reconstructed by limiting the volume. I just kind of showed you this it was here in case of an emergency, but. Notice that this case, I have a hole in the side. I decided that I didn't want to have that part um, of my geometry, so I just put a hole through there and it created a part that looked like that. Going back to this, um, again, the part is, in this case, the part is vibrating and is moving like, okay. Let me go back to the previous slide, as I was just sharing it. Here, I was just showing that I can play this from here. I did just kind of show this as a demonstration a minute ago, but this is the uh, a design that I used where I cut a hole in the side uh, to see if I could remove more material. So you can always use the avoid material to try to get around those problems. Uh, and here again is another video where I basically uh, changed the volume down to 45 and it's gonna reconstruct. So we just kind of saw that already. So I'm gonna skip ahead to this and show you this right here. It shows you the kind of displacement that's happening. This was a modal analysis and the part is moving cylindrically back and forth. And this is the optimal part uh, to avoid that. Right. Um, another part that I designed is a part that just starts with three bushings and three pins. And the idea is I created a simple um, space, which is my playground, which is just these tangent um, uh, edges in the sketch. You can see that. And it produced me a part that looks like this. It was quite interesting. And um, this part here is something that, um, you know, to me is a very cool looking part, but also shows off the benefits of, of Creo. And then I also set it to say, you know what? I plan to machine this. And so I actually have this version here, which was machined. Uh, and notice it added a connector here by its side. And I gave it a new problem. I said that there was another pipe going in this opposite direction. And so it knew how to add that connection here. And I could actually 3D print this. I could uh, use a laser cutter to cut that part. Uh, but I wanted to show that um, that happens as well. And just to show you the kind of um, animation deformation if you remember earlier, I was showing you that I set one of the pins to be free and then another one was rigid. Um, so this is what happens. You know, one of them is free and one of them is rigid. So one is following a cylindrical, the other one's free to move. All right, let me ask another poll question. Would you like to try and use generative design in your next project? Do you see opportunities for parts that you just know were designed so primitively that you like new ideas. You'd like to leverage the computer to solve those problems for you. Okay, we get one no, that's fine. You know, it's uh, 
This is new AI technology, by the way, that's using this. Um, so I'm going to end the results and share the poll. So most of you are interested in generative design. That makes me very happy because I'm interested in it too. I'm going to share my screen once again, get back to my slides. Because what I'd like to show you is you can even do things like this. I saw uh, online someone posted that they created a generative design faucet. So I thought for today that I would show you that my attempt, I used a modal analysis and I kept getting these uh, various design shapes until I was able to kind of get into a shape that looked uh, getting close to what I wanted. Okay, and these are all the various iterations. Uh, but then, then I realized, you know, instead of doing a modal study, I really should use a actual uh, physical study, an FEA study. And you can see that's where I started to get the kind of look. Oh, you can see that right now? Okay. So the idea is I wanted to design a faucet. You heard me talk about this. These are the various iterations I did with a modal analysis, just tweaking and changing one value and trying it over and over again. And I realized that I really need to run an FEA, fun an FEA study. And once I started applying loads to it, did I finally get the geometry? And, and so this is kind of an interesting case. I'm really looking to create something more aesthetic. Uh, I actually created this faucet and showed it to my wife and she made a joke at me and said, I'll never clean that. Uh, but it's pretty cool looking if you think about that. And here's a, here's one that has actually no uh, no pipe inside. This would spray everybody, but it would look, it's pretty cool looking. Uh, so you can use um, GTO to, uh, to create parts that look like this as well. Um, and uh, I would use material spreading option here to spread as much of the material over as I could. Uh, and I could have used a symmetric feature to make sure that I got it more uniform on both sides. But again, this was just an experiment. And then I thought, all right, what if I created a wheel? What would Creo come up with with a wheel? So I created a wheel. I set up my loads. I made the axle uh, sort of fixed uh, with the bearing load. And then I applied these forces. Uh, and you can see what it does. It created me a geometry that looks like that. I think that's me saving like 45%. And then at some point I said, you know, I'm looking for something more symmetrical. So I used one of the symmetrical options and I got something that looked like this. And then ultimately I got a part that looked like this, which has some um, other settings where I use symmetry, mirroring, minimum crease size. And then I even got a part that looked like that. So Creo can be used um, and GTO can be used to discover new ways about making things. Um, I enjoy using it to try, try to solve new problems. I hope that today has been useful. And um, I just thought I would close and sort of show you that I have actually <laughs> 3D printed uh, this part and I'm using it in my basement. I do actually need to carry these pipes and they're not they're not copper pipes. They're not. They're actually quite heavy, so I'm um, I'm I'm quite happy with the design, and I've got about uh, ten of them to install. But this is my slicer showing you that I created a part using Creo that requires no support. Uh, by using that build direction option and knowing that my and then knowing that I had a build uh, of 45 degree angles, it could produce me a part that I had that I printed with no support. And just to sort of prove that point. That's the part that I, or one part that I thought um, would work, and here is the one that I actually printed. And so that's sort of living proof that uh, you can go from art to part. You can let the computer design uh, the problem for you. You can come up with new ways to solve interesting problems. So with that, I will say thank you for listening, and I can take any questions. I should have said in the beginning that if you had questions, please enter them into the chat. Um, we can also take questions later on, um, easy to reach. So let me just take a, let me just see if I have another poll here. I think that was the last poll. Yes, most people like to try generative design. That's really cool. Um, and, it's, you know, if I can learn it, you can learn it too. Um, that's why I've included Terry here. So if you had questions about, you know, loads and constraints, have a buddy, have someone who went to school for those things, have someone who understands FEA, 
Um, and, but they're, they're pretty simple to understand once it gets broken down. And I think Terry's going to be doing a, a webinar soon on simulation and how it, how it works and so forth. So if there aren't any questions, I would hope that you'd reach out to me. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I'm all over LinkedIn. I share this content. I'm also able to be reached through my email here. And if you're interested in any of this stuff and want to use this type of technology or company, let's have a discussion. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much for joining me today.